Xbox On. Welcome to Xbox On, a podcast with one host about one console, Xbox. I am said host, Jesse DeRosa, and on today's episode, we'll be talking about the latest Xbox news for the week of December 23rd, 2021, including Double Fine is working on multiple future projects, Back for Blood developer Turtle Rock got bought out by Tencent, Ho Ho Ho, Happy Holidays, you sweaty green freaks, and more. Welcome, welcome, welcome to episode 133 of Xbox On, you little slimy babies, you. Guys, this is the last, second to last episode of the year, and first time, I don't know, in like how many months that we have a actual slow news week, so this is a little unprecedented here. We've been going on the uh, two and a half, three hour podcast kind of trend for a past month or two, and now here we are. We got a slow news week, but... Still a fun news week, so don't click off, you stupid idiot. And, you know, the good thing for people like me this time of year is there are so few podcasts that are actually posting around the holidays that, baby, you don't got no choice. You're stuck with me. I'm the only podcast you got, so even if you don't like what I got to say, what are you going to go do? Listen to a fucking rerun of Car Talk? I don't think so. Hey, guys, quick update from last week. My cat is still terrified of Nerf guns, but I bought two more Nerf guns, so I got the Rival Series. These are the Nerf guns made for, like, big kids, so, like, these are the Nerf guns that... You know, you, you, shoot, you shoot someone with one of these, you take the goddamn eye out. Not really, but, you know, it's more fun than the, the regular Nerf guns. Anyway, I, I want to start off this week's episode. We're going to try to follow the format as normal as we can, but I will say there are fewer write-ins this week, fewer news stories to get to this week, and there are no... There's no game drop from Xbox Wire, but that doesn't matter. We've been kind of skipping that a lot lately anyway. So... We're going to try to try to follow a normal run of show, but it may be a little mismatched here. Now, there's a couple things I just want to remind you of. Next week's episode, the final podcast of 2021, we will be doing... I have a, a little surprise for you, but we will be doing a top five games of 2021. I will be doing mine, but I've encouraged you to please write in with your top five favorite games of 2021 it does not have to be games that came out this year just as you know games you played this year so any order for any reason any game can be on the list as long as it's not a kingdom hearts game we're all good so you know make your list feel free to leave a comment in the podcast this week on youtube uh youtube.com slash c slash xbox on podcast uh leave leave a comment with your top five games of the year and we'll be able to do that on next week's podcast a bunch of you've already written in so we we've got a growing list but guys i need more i need more and more and more i'm an insatiable ass hole and i need more of your comments so please leave those we'll have a fun a little special episode next week to kind of round out the year now that's the first order of business the second thing i want to open with is guys first time in three months i got a new youtube video out so finally gave myself that kick in the ass thank you ea's king for helping me get there uh i I put out a new video i worked all weekend on it it's a, it's, a, it's a new one. It's different. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to do fun shit. You know, I used to try to take YouTube. Years ago, I did YouTube, and I tried to do it really seriously. I tried to really, like, try to build a channel and be consistent with the schedule and all that. And I realized, you know, you, you'll burn yourself out real fast because it's disheartening when you put, like, 40 hours into a video. And then it's like, great. Uh, over the past two months, 30 people have watched my video, and I'm pretty sure, like, 12 of them are, like, family members and coworkers. So I, I'm trying to just have fun with it this time. But I need to get videos out at a more regular clip than what I've been doing because three months is too long. But guys, new video is up now. It's on my other YouTube page. I try to keep this YouTube page where Xbox On goes just dedicated to the podcast so that people who just want a podcast can have that. But if you want to follow my other YouTube endeavors where I'm doing funny shit, super awesome crap, you guys like Jake Paul, you guys like, uh, I don't know, PewDiePie, oh, you're going to want to follow me. I'm just like those guys, but only better, guys. So, yeah, it's a lightning. It, it's linked in the podcast if you're listening on Spotify or whatever you're listening 
focusing on, you'll see a link to my channel, but it's youtube.com slash C slash slash lightning extreme. Same as my Twitch account, lightning extreme. Yeah. It's all, all about ranking. It's a rank list of our favorite defunct Taco Bell menu items. It's a lot of fun. There's going to be a quick 10 minute video ended up being a 25 minute plus video, but it's, it's a lot of fun. And I put a lot, a lot more editing into it than I initially thought I would. And uh, it turned out, turned out quite fun. So please give it a watch. Give, give, Give me a subscribe over there if you don't mind. It it would mean the world to me if you if you if you if you're like, hey Jesse, I've been listening to your podcast for a while. I, I like what you're doing here. Then I would really highly beg you to give my my new YouTube page a, a check a look because, man, YouTube videos take just way more work than the podcast. So it, it it can be it can be a little much when it's like, wow, twenty hours of work, ten views, huh? But anyway. Enough of me just complaining and moping about the things I choose to do with my life. Guys, we have a whole podcast to do this week, so I will bore you no more. A couple, like, small stories I just want to touch on, updates, things of that nature, uh, little amusing anecdotes before we jump into comments and regular news. A few things. First of all, GamesIndustry.biz is reporting that the Game Awards, or rather the Game Awards reported on, on Twitter and GamesIndustry.biz relayed that... This past year, the Game Awards that took place two weeks ago uh, had a total viewership of 85 million live, 85 million live streams uh, for 2021, which is a only a two percent increase year over year compared to last year's event. But if you look at the numbers and the trends over the past like six or seven years, the show has grown like exponentially. It went from like one million to three million to like ten to twenty to thirty, you know, and now we're at 85 million views. That's Pretty impressive. So I just want to give a, a shout out to them and congrats on that. This is a this is a big show. You know, we we heart I especially rag on this show quite a bit. We talked about it the whole the, the week we were going over the game awards, just basically how the awards part of it is stupid, the ad part of it is stupid. There's so much stupidity and cucking and and just industry uh jerking off kind of going around the show. And the only real reason to watch is for the cool announcements. But you know, this I, I want to give credit where credit's due. This is you know, just simply by by sheer number and audience, this is the biggest, you know, kind of year event that happens with video games and or at least in terms of like game award type award ceremony recognition kind of events. And, you know, it's not easy to build and grow a show like this. So I want to give a give props to Jeff Keighley and the team for a successful year. So I found that quite amusing. I, at this point, man, it's just like the fact that they have that much reach and that much viewership and they put on that meh of a show every year i just was like man I feel like uh the, the, it's there you know the the opportunity is there for the taking for someone to just be like hey here's a better show but yeah 85 million viewers that's that's no joke next up i want to point out a, a website uh, I've, I've never heard of until this week called the loadout uh wrote a really interesting little piece kind of adding up all the games that were introduced or available through game pass in the year 2021 and adding up that value to see how much value was in that Game Pass subscription this year. And so they added all the games that kind of came and went were available on the platform throughout the year and based the pricing of each game based on what the game costs if you buy it from Microsoft Store, which is obviously how you buy the games if you bought them all digitally. Uh, so pretty, pretty fair price comparison there. And everything added up to just over 6,300 US dollars or 4,700 plus euro. So that is a shit ton of money when you think about a service that you're paying 10 to $15 a month for, and you're getting things like Outriders and MLB The Show and, and Halo Infinite and Forza Horizon 5 and all these games day one back for blood. Day one? That's a really fucking solid... I mean, obviously, there's no one out there who's debating whether or not Xbox Game Pass is a good value, but that's a... That's a fun way to put it into context. It's like, okay, you paid, you know, you pay $15 a month times 12 months. That is eight, 180, you know, it's your Xbox Live and your Game Pass combined. $180 gets you $6,300 worth of games to play. And a lot of those are massive games that come out day and date on the service. I think that is an objectively phenomenal deal. So I just thought that was a lot of fun. And then another one here, and this should, I guess this could have been like a proper news story. It's just, I don't really have much to say on it because it's just such an old story from, or rather it's, it's a news story about something that happened so long ago and it, it holds no relevancy um, other than it just kind of falling under that category of like, oh, that's amusing, right? But uh, VGC did a story that was relayed from a podcast or a Twitch interview called The Real Brandalorian. 
And in the in the conversation, Kim Salzer, who served as EA's director of product marketing from 2000 to 2003, at that time when she when she was in that position, the publisher EA had uh, rights to the Harry Potter games. You may remember the Harry Potter licensed tie-in games of the of that era. Um, so in the conversation, when asked about the games that she was involved with, that she was most excited about, but ultimately never saw a lie of day, so canceled projects. Of course, she noted a Harry Potter massively multiplayer online game. She says, "quote." A big one for me because I was so personally involved in it and it's such a huge IP that has lived on it is a online massively multiplayer game for Harry Potter. Thoroughly researched, very confident in the success of this, but it was killed for lack of a better term uh, because EA was going through the changes at that time and they just didn't know or believe enough that the Harry Potter IP would have a shelf life longer than a year or two. So that's so crazy to think about in hindsight because we know Harry Potter is one of these franchises it's like Lord of the Rings. It's like Spider-Man. It's like, you know, Back to the Future. It's like just one of those timeless franchises and movie franchises that people just hold on to and is endlessly, you know, just uh, beloved and, and quoted and rewatched and admired from generations and generations. It's become an instant classic. Obviously, it was that way basically from the get when the first book came out. But it's funny to think that EA was like, oh, we don't know if we believe in this IP long term even though you know come 2003 2004 the first harry potter the first few harry potter books had already been out what like four or five years didn't the first harry potter book come out in like 98 or 97 or something like that so actually i could be totally wrong maybe it was 99 i don't know but i mean i just find that i find that in, absolutely insane that someone was just like oh yeah we don't we don't know if we believe in this thing that's like already proven to be a massive hit and then 20 years later it's just like <laughs> harry potter is just as big as it's always been <laughs> essentially that's crazy but, I mean, obviously it holds no relevancy today just because we're 20 years removed from this information. There's, you know, this is nothing more than just a callback to a project that clearly never made its way off off the drawing board. So that's that's too bad. Uh, honestly, I, I feel like there's still a lot of potential for a Harry Potter MMO. I think, I think Harry Potter MMO has more potential than a lot of other games that actually have MMOs. Like they, you'll see like DC superheroes online. I think they're making a Marvel game that's like that right now. Like I, I don't know. It doesn't Harry Potter make perfect sense? You make your own wizard. You, you, co you like role play your little school life. You could do like a Persona kind of dude. You could actually you could just make a Harry Potter Persona game. But uh, that's that's beside the point. I just feel like a Harry Potter MMO game just the, that that IP screams MMO. And it's absolutely ridiculous. That's like 20 years later and no one's made something of that. But at the same time, I guess MMOs have kind of taken a backseat a little bit. It's more of a general games as a service is the kind of trend these days. So even that, you could definitely, God, like a, you could definitely do a Harry Potter online platform based, ser you know, service based platform. Man, what a, what a missed opportunity. Uh, anyway, then the final one, this is an update uh, from a story from last week. Mazman, also known as my daddy, but not really, he's not my daddy, wrote in and, and said, Jesse, it looks like Stalker 2 developers heard the podcast. They've now backed off all NFTs for the game. Guys, update. Last week we talked about Stalker 2 adding NFTs, taking the Ubisoft route. Everyone was pissed, but now we got an update. Despite its attempts, this is from VGC, despite attempts at an explanation, fan backlash continues just a few hours after a deleted tweet that tried to replace a new, much shorter statement announcing plans to completely scrap the idea of NFTs in Stalker 2. Announcement reads, Dear Stalkers, we hear you. Based on the feedback we've received, we've made the decision to cancel anything NFT related in Stalker 2. The interests of our fans and players are the top priority for our team. We're making this game for you to enjoy whatever the costs. If you care, we care too. So this is obviously the way to handle it. So I I, I feel like you might be surprised to hear my take on this. I'm First of all, I'm, I'm glad that they're backing off this and we're not going to have NFTs in Stalker 2. That makes me, that, that puts me back to being significantly more interested in this game. But the, the thing that does <laughs> kind of suck about this is Stalker 2 is obviously a game that's a lot more indie kind of, gr you know, grassroot effort kind of development attitude towards how this game is being brought up, made and funded, and how this development team is, you know, making it. So the thought of doing something like this NFT thing, just because this is a smaller, more independent team, reads to me more like, oh, well, these guys are just, you know, trying their hands at a couple ways to make this a more profitable experience so they can 
you know, make a living off and survive off the development of this game. So even though I don't like this approach, this NFT approach, I, I feel like I'm I'm more sympathetic to and willing to give a pass to something like this. Whereas with Ubisoft, I'm like, fuck you, Ubisoft. You have all the money in the world. No one likes you. Why would you do this? You know, it's it, it's theoretic. It's morally the same bullshit and, and, and they should be held to the same standard. But I can't help but be like a little more like, oh, they were just trying to find a way to make the game profitable. <laughs> but no, 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 no. I mean, I, I, I stand. I, listen, I stand by what I said, and I, I think someone wrote in the comments. So we might get back around to this, but l the short and sweet of it, I, I think NFTs are a fucking pyramid scheme. I think it's, I, I maybe it's just my ineptitude, but I'm, I'm pretty fair. I'm, I'm fairly certain everyone who tries to defend NFTs or tries to like make a counter argument can't actually make a counter argument they just play devil's advocate and say oh but nfts aren't bad because you're owning something and you can sell it and someone finds value it's like yeah yeah re-establishing the same basic two sentence explanation of nfts doesn't make them make sense it's the fact that no one in the world wants to buy one of these things that makes it not make sense so whatever but well <laughs> i'm glad to see that they made the right decision Clearly, they are much smaller, much much less capable of adapting in 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 dealing with backlash. You know, the the potential consequence of something like this going belly up is is much more devastating to a smaller team than than something like you know Ubisoft facing backlash for something they're doing in one of their games. So they they kind of can't afford the the bad the bad backlash and and kind of need to do this. So I think that's why they were so quick to be like, okay, 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 we'll back off on this. Whereas you know Ubisoft, as we've seen, have kind of doubled down and be like. Fuck you guys, NFTs are happening and it's just the beginning, you know? So it's kind of funny to see both tax, but you, you have different options depending on if you're a massive publisher like Ubisoft or if you're a smaller independent team. All right, guys, and with all that top of the top of the morning news and announcements out of the way, let's jump into some of your comments. You know how it works, guys. You go on over to youtube.com slash C slash Xbox on podcast. You hit the enter key and you click on the latest episode of the podcast and you leave yourself a comment. You can say something real nice like, Jesse, Nerf guns are cool. I think it's so cool that you're buying Nerf guns. In fact, kind of makes you look like a badass. Would you be interested in doing a photo shoot where you put oil on your abs and take off your shirt and, and pose with all your awesome Nerf guns? I think that would be badass. Keep up the good work. And I'd be like, dude, fucking awesome. Awesome comment. You're so cool. Thanks, man. Or you could be a total asshole and be like, Jesse, listen, Christmas is just around the corner. But if I if there's only one thing I could ask for Santa, it would be that uh, that aliens would come down from outer space and that they would break into your, your home in the middle of the night, destroy all your Nerf guns because you're a fucking child and no one likes you. And then when you wake up on Christmas morning, instead of a tree with tons of little presents like a, like a 12 pack of Mountain Dew, you would actually just see all your all your Nerf guns ground grinded to plastic dust, and you would be very sad. That that would make me happy. That would bring me holiday cheer. And I'll be like, you were just such a miserable little Grinch. But you know what? You're welcome to think that way and to feel that way. And so I'd read your comment. And that's how that works. But you know, let's let's talk about some actual comments that really did happen. So our first one here comes from Headhunting Halo and Headhunting Halo. I gotta say, don't skip last week's podcast. You wrote. Jesse, I'm so sad I have to skip this week's show. I haven't beaten Halo Infinite yet. I'm playing on Legendary, collecting everything in one run, and I'm getting multiplayer weekly ultimate rewards. It is tough in the grind, but it keeps me wanting more. By the way, Tobey Maguire is the best Spider-Man, and Green Goblin is the best villain. Have a good week, and I'll listen to the episode when I complete the campaign. Listen, a lot of you guys, I, I, a, couple, oh, a couple of you guys were like, oh no, I haven't beaten the campaign, I can't listen to the podcast. I was like, listen guys, the podcast is a regular podcast for two hours and then the last hour of the show is the spoiler so you can you can just listen to the podcast and i give you ample time to click off before we start talking halo infinite so you can listen to last week's podcast don't don't listen don't ruin my numbers because you're a bad listener just kidding love you head hunting halo and of course toby mcguire is the best spider-man that is not a nostalgia thing i'm so fucking tired of people trying to say that's a nostalgia thing that is an objective truth it is so annoying listen as a huge spider-man fan i will say Every Spider-Man is a good Spider-Man that we've seen so far in, in, in the movies. The movies are are of varying quality, but I will say Tobey Maguire has been a great Spider-Man. Andrew Garfield has been a good Spider-Man. Tom Holland's been a good Spider-Man. Yeah, Into the Spider-Verse was a great movie. Miles, that, that depiction of Miles Morales was a great Spider-Man, but the best Spider-Man we've had in, 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 in movies is still Tobey Maguire. You, you, you can't, this is just simply a fact 
please stop arguing. We don't even need to talk about this because, like I said, they're all good in their own way. All these movies and all these actors have something different to offer, and there's value in all of them. But simply put, Toby is the best. And also, Green Goblin is not the best villain. The best villain is the best villain from, I don't know, I, I like Sandman a lot, and I know people are going to like be like, what the fuck? But I think technically Doc Ock was the best, but whatever. All right, gamer score update. Cranky Old Man in Training wrote in says, the gamer score right now is, your gamer score right now is 66600, and I'm just thinking, you know that's that's metal as fuck and so yeah of course it's metal as fuck you know i'm metal as fuck i wouldn't be sitting here in my boxers holding a nerf elite rival blaster it's not a nerf elite it's a nerf rival chronos blaster i wouldn't be holding one of my goddamn hands you hear the plastic if i weren't a fucking metal awesome as fuck kind of guy so yeah my gamer score is 666 you got a problem with that bitch halo update count scott Love wrote in and says i wrapped up halo infinite earlier this week and i never wanted it to end 10 out of 10, this game is easily my favorite Halo campaign. The entire experience was sort of pure joy for me. I could not stop playing. I have lots of opinions on how they can make it even better, and that's the crazy part. I love the game so much, and it's nowhere near it at its full potential. I complained about the biomes and enemy variety early on, but by the end of the... By the end of the environments, the enemies continue to provide enough that I never got boring or dull to explore. I t I'm typically not the kind of person who cares about doing every task, finding every collectible, but I just can't stop myself here. Traversal and ability to call in whatever vehicle you want makes it worthwhile to just keep knocking things off the list. Getting very close to running out of things to do. I understand that some people are upset that four and five don't get wrapped up here story-wise, but I just don't even care. I was enjoying the current story so much. Anyways, I'm really looking forward to the expansions on this game. I cannot wait until we get Halo Infinite The Endless. So, I will say, I, I don't know, I, I'm a little distant from Halo Infinite now after a couple weeks because I, I haven't been playing it as much. Uh, I've, been, I've been distracted with other things. This week I've been very Spider-Man distracted. I saw, I saw the new Spider-Man movie over the weekend and I gotta be honest with you, like we were just kind of talking about with headhunting Halo, like those those original, and obviously a lot of people feel this way, especially, you know, this is a, we're at that point in time where people like my age, a little bit older, a little bit younger, grew up with those Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies, and you know, those were, those were my movies, those are the only movies, you know, people have those experiences talking about like Ghostbusters or Jurassic Park or whatever, where it's like, oh, I watched that movie every, Star Wars, you know, I watched that movie a million times as a kid, I had the PJs and the action figures and everything, I never had that experience with anything growing up except for Spider-Man. That was the only thing with those original Spider-Man movies. So getting to see this uh, this new Spider-Man movie, and I won't we won't talk spoilers. I know a lot of people haven't seen it, but just having obviously you know the trailers tell you that the villains from the other movies are in this movie. So just having having callbacks to and references to and content from pulled from that original Sam Raimi Spider-Man trilogy. I knew it was it was going to be special. And I knew I was excited about it, but it was one of those things I really couldn't understand the weight and the gravity of the situation until I was there in the theater watching it happen before my eyes. But like I don't I don't know, dude. Like from I was genuinely depressed when when it became apparent we weren't going to get a Sam Raimi Spider Man Four movie. And so just I don't know, being here at age twenty six, sitting in the movie theater, watching in the year two thousand twenty one a new Spider-Man movie where I'm watching Sam Raimi's characters come to life on screen again, you know, Doc Ock and Green Goblin and, and, and Sandman come to life on screen again. It's just like, it, it was a very emotional moment for me. And that has wrecked my fucking week. I haven't been able to play a video game this week. Haven't been able to give a shit about Halo, despite the fact that I'm, I'm so happy we got Halo Infinite now. Haven't been able to do literally anything with my free time other than just watch tons of videos on Spider-Man on YouTube, rewatch all the old Spider-Man movies, including the Andrew Garfield movies, and just, just really like a re, I don't know, Spider-Man's one of those things, like, I love it so much, but as much as I like Tom Holland's Spider-Man, I think he's great, he doesn't, it doesn't scratch that nostalgia itch, and, and, and it doesn't resonate with me as Spider-Man the way like Tobey Maguire's Spider-Man does, so I'm kind of going through a, a, a little bit of a childhood renaissance right now with the Spidey. And I know it has nothing to do with Halo Infinite, but that's just my way of saying I'm having a hard time really thinking about Halo and articulating my thoughts on Halo right now because that was... I, I was just so caught off guard by Spider-Man right now that I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> but to me, Halo and Spider-Man have so much in common because my uh, my feelings on Spider-Man as far as like toys and TV shows and movies are concerned... Uh, generally that is my, my feelings towards, you know, games, games are where I have that kind of emotional attachment and connection. So normally in the game space, my, that kind of nostalgia is usually reserved for like Halo three or Sonic Unleashed or 
you know, Guitar Hero or fucking Left 4 Dead. So it's weird. It's usually I don't have this level of like deep nostalgia and excitement for something fictional outside of video games. But man, right now I'm just I will, I will say, though, talking about Halo Infinite, since you're clearly not even fucking talking about Spider-Man. <laughs> since you're talking about Halo Infinite, I will, I will say. Yeah, the, the, the one thing again, no spoilers. We're not talking spoilers. I'm, I'm going to make sure before we won't talk about Halo Infinite story details out in the open freely like that for a long time. We'll give people a lot of time to really catch up before we can go around talking about how master chief gets completely naked in this game but one thing that key that keeps staying with me with halo infinite is how there are so many criticisms i have on this game that are entirely legitimate criticisms that if it were any other game these criticisms would would really hinder my opinion on it i have you know, I, I personally loved the story of Halo Infinite, but I am also extremely critical of the story at the same time. I have a lot of opinions about the lack of, bio, uh, of biodiversity and environmental diversity in the game, but it didn't impact my enjoyment of the game whatsoever. I have huge complaints about the fact that the Prometheans aren't even in the goddamn game, and so enemy variety is lacking, and, and it's just like there's no explanation for where these guys went, but still... I had so much fun with this game that I'm also able to look past that. Halo Infinite is a very rare, very random example of a game where it has some very serious problems, but the game is so incredibly fun and captivating and, 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 and just special and unique to experience that you're able to look over things that are generally pretty serious, pretty serious um, criticisms and, 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 and missteps. And I mean, this just goes to show kind of, you know, I think Halo Infinite or at least for me, speaking from my perspective, you're someone who listens to this podcast and gets feedback on games from me because you listen to this podcast. I will say Halo Infinite is the perfect example of why subjectivity, why it's important to understand subjectivity because I will get on this podcast and I will rip on Zelda Breath of the Wild all the time like I always do. If you guys watch my stream, you see me do it sometimes. Uh, I do it on this podcast sometimes. And I have some scathing criticisms of Zelda Breath of the Wild, a game most people consider to be a masterpiece, a game that personally I think is good, but not nearly as good as other people think. And I just will tear that game apart about how its story is shit, its gameplay is repetitive and shallow, and all these things that it does, its, its world is empty and boring, and all these things I criticize that game for, but... When I experience something like Halo Infinite, I'm able to recognize it's like, listen, man, Halo Infinite has probably like equal issues to Zelda Breath of the Wild, where it's like, you know, Breath of the Wild's story sucks because the acting is terrible, the writing is terrible, and the story is bare bones and, and pedestrian. Halo Infinite story is really well written, really well acted, really well pulled off in terms of just the the cinematic and in and, and just engrossing, captivating nature of it all. But if you're someone who follows the Halo lore to a T, Halo Infinite has massive story issues because it just sweeps under the rug Halos 4 and 5. It just explains massive plot points of Halo 5 and what happens after that game. Just kind of off screen and behind the scenes and things like that. It's, it, in some ways, it does a terrible job of being a sequel to Halo 5. But again, it's just this game just subjectively, it clicks with me, it resonates with me. So I'm able to overlook that and just be like, I don't care. It's, the game's a masterpiece. It's a 10 out of 10. I love it. And I just think it's important to use this as an example to be like, guys, subjectivity matters. It, it, it matters that we understand what it is and we take that into account when we're listening to people's opinions because we talk about these things and it's like, I sound so hypocritical, you know, saying Zelda Breath of the Wild sucks for X, Y, and Z. And then being like, Halo Infinite has problem X, Y, and Z, but I'm willing to overlook that and call it a masterpiece anyway. It's like, you fucking hypocrite. But as much as I recognize, yes, it's hypocritical. It's like, this is subjectivity. It's like, in Halo Infinite, the game is so goddamn good and captivating to me personally that I'm able to overlook its many, many issues, its many glaring issues, and be like, yeah, the game's still a fucking masterpiece anyway. I don't know why. That's just how it works. But um, that's that's why it's important. Dude. Like, And this is the thing. It's like, it makes me so mad still this day when I see like an IGN review and people are like, oh, IGN is so bad at reviewing games. Of course they gave it a 9 out of 10. They give everything a great score. Or like, oh, they're so bad at criticizing. Or they're so bad that it's like, Guys, you can't get you can't blame IGN the brand name. It's like these are individuals behind the reviews talking about games. And this is why it's really important to like know your critics and get to find people who it's like, oh, I usually gravitate towards their opinions on games because we like similar games or we dislike similar games. So I can trust their takes and their opinions because it's like subjectivity, it's such a funny thing. It's like, you know, you just just compare my criticism towards Halo or um Zelda Breath of the Wild to my 
my glowing just adoration for Halo Infinite and be like, this guy's such a fucking hypocrite. But if you're someone like me who agrees that Zelda Breath of the Wild's a little overrated and Halo Infinite is kind of a fucking masterpiece, you'll be like, I, ju I get what he means. Like, I, I just gravitate towards this, these kinds of games and this game works for me. And uh, yeah, man, it's like this <laughs> Halo... Halo Infinite has some serious problems, but at the same time, this is this is the first thing I said when I talked about my opinions on Halo Infinite, having played the campaign, and it's the, the thing I'll wrap up with right now, which is that I can think of very, very few games in the history of my entire life of playing video games. I've been playing video games since I was four years old, and I can think of like like maybe three to three to five games in my life where it's just like, yeah, the game came out, I sat down to play the game. And I had zero interest in doing anything other than continuing to play this game until I saw it through the end. I didn't want to sleep. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to take a break. I didn't want to let my eyes rest at all. I didn't want to go do my job. I didn't want to go walk my cat. I didn't want to go pay my taxes. I didn't want to go uh, solve world hunger. I didn't want to do a single thing other than watch the TV, hold the controller, and continue to experience this game. And despite Halo's in Halo Infinite's issues with story... And lack of diversity in environments, lack of diversity in enemy types, promise of a big open world, but actually being a pretty small scale kind of empty, regular size open world. All, but despite all these issues, it's just like, I don't care. This game was a masterpiece. Like I would, I, it took me 14 and a half hours to beat Halo Infinite. I paid uh, zero additional dollars other than my $15 a month Game Pass subscription. I would have gladly paid $500 for that experience. I wouldn't trade it for the world. It was worth every fucking second. I don't regret a thing. It was great. I don't know, man. That's just how that's how subjectivity works. It's how some things just resonate with you and some things don't. But K Count Skyla, thank you for writing a really thoughtful, long comment about your thoughts on Halo Infinite. And thank you for allowing me to completely derail your comment by talking about how I love Sam Raimi's Spider-Man trilogy and then coming back to Halo to talk about why I like Halo, basically just ignoring what you're talking about. K Count Skyla, you were such a kind... You're such a, a kind and patient individual to allow me to just hijack your your point like that. But you know what? That's that's why it's called Xbox on podcast, because you turn it on and it just goes on and on and on and on. And it's kind of just rambly like that. Dead Captain James. Remember him? Well, I'm going to make you remember. He says, I will only be able to watch part of your podcast this week because I'm 15 hours into Halo Infinite and only four missions into the campaign. Update. I finished the game. Holy fuck, it was good. I'm so happy with the direction of Halo. That was Dead Captain James writing in to say, I love this game so much, I'm pouring all this time into the game. I can't even get past Mission 4 because I'm just having so much fun playing it. And then a few days later, updating to be like, yo, I couldn't put the game down and then I finished it and it was so good. So guys, you don't have to take my word for it. But look at Count Skyla and look at Dead Captain James. They got nothing to say but glowing, glowing reviews. You'd be a fucking idiot not to trust them. These guys are goddamn geniuses. They know everything. My mom writes in and says, I think at this point it's clear that we need to get you a sponsor in the baby wipe world. I would love that. Now, I told you we get back to NFTs, and unfortunately, here we are. We'll, we'll keep it brief, I promise. Way of the Lau writes in and says, yo, 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 word. Hope everyone is doing well and safe during this holiday season. Jesse, how dare you have a different opinion than me and use your own podcast that you work so hard on to, di to diss on ketchup? What would you go to McDonald's and say, give me a Big Mac meal with a side of mayonnaise? All joking aside, I think NFTs are bullshit. No, no hate to anyone who's involved with them, but keep that shit out of gaming. I get it that all these companies want their games to make more money. However, involving NFTs is going to make consoles and gaming more like mobile gaming. Despite what anyone says, mobile gaming is mostly filled with money-grabbing crap that doesn't give you get you any closer to completing the game. Mobile devices are powerful enough that you could make better games on them anyways. Furthermore, I think that your communist capital should be kept out of gaming. Thank you, and I hope all of you are well and have a great holiday season. Way of the Lao. Thank you for writing in. I appreciate your comment. And I will just say, I mean, you didn't say it does, but we, we all know the Big Mac doesn't come with ketchup. And would I get would I get a side of mayo with my Big Mac? No, because the Big Mac has special sauce, which is basically, oh, I see what you're saying. Because it has that special sauce, which is basically just a mix of ketchup and mayo. But no, no, no. See, the thing is, I can handle ketchup if it is included in a sauce. If it's like one of the ingredients of this sauce is ketchup. I'm not happy about that. And I don't prefer it, but I can handle it. So if we're talking about like Thousand Island dressing, which is basically what they put on a Big Mac, sure, I'll deal with it. The Big Mac's a great sandwich. I like it. But I wouldn't go out of my way to put ketchup on anything I eat. 
And if I'm ordering something that has just regular ketchup on it, I will ask without, and I usually almost never modify food. The only exception is if it has ketchup or cilantro. And then finally, let's just say hypothetically I'm Gordon Ramsay. We'll put it this way. I'm Gordon Ramsay. I'm a renowned, respected chef. Everyone loves me in the the culinary world. This is all I'm saying. I'm not telling you you suck if you eat ketchup. But what I am telling you is I get paid millions of dollars to be a goddamn culinary genius. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have restaurants all over the world, and I'm going to put ketchup on zero of those menus. And you're still going to come to my restaurant, and you're still going to rave to your friends about how it was one of the greatest dining experiences of your life. And your friend's going to look at you and say, and no ketchup? And you're going to say, yeah, and no ketchup. So that's all I'm saying. So we can talk about ketchup here, ketchup there. Oh, you don't eat ketchup here? You don't? You, you, what would you do with this and that? And listen, Gordon Ramsay's not fucking with ketchup, so why should I? So why should you think about that way allow? And yeah, NFTs, bullshit. You, you know, I'll take it a step further. You say no hate to anyone involved with NFTs, but keep that shit out of gaming. I'll, I'll, I'll take it a step further. No hate to anyone who, you know, thinks it's, you know, wants to partake in the NFT game of buying and selling and all that on a consumer basis. Yeah, no hate to anyone involved, but I'll, I'll take it to the next step and say, to all these companies trying to jump in on NFTs and be a part of this and to the, all the celebrities and the major corporations and all these assholes, money launderers behind the scenes trying to make this shit happen. I will say absolutely hate, hate thrown your way a hundred percent because I, I deeply believe NFTs are a fucking scam. So I, I will definitely throw some hate your way, but yeah, I, I, I think, I think that's a lot of why gamers are upset about the NFT thing is it does add sort of a, ugly microtransaction kind of mobile gamey thing to gamey where even if you know you you play tom clancy's x defiant xenoblade chronicles or whatever and they're like listen man our nfts have no impact on gameplay it's all purely optional and cosmetic sure that's fine but your game still looks ugly when i boot up the game and the menus are trying to get me to go to the store and buy this bullshit and invest in that bullshit it makes your game shittier i'm just telling you right now games are shittier because of microtransactions, and this would make that already ugly experience even uglier if you threw NFTs into the mix. So I totally take your point, Wade. Allow you're absolutely right. It, it, introducing NFTs to games, especially AAA sixty dollar console gaming experiences, just further waters down the experience and brings us a step closer to Raid Shadow Legends, which is also the sponsor of this week's podcast. Guys, let me talk to you for one and a half minutes. It's no coincidence that I'm I'm being paid for a minute and a half to talk about this. Raid Shadow Legends. This is my favorite game. Even though I literally never talk about video games on this pod, or I never talk about Raid Shadow Legends on this on this podcast when I'm not being sponsored. Let me just bring up to you. I'm actually super addicted to this game. Yeah, I know. We're always talking about Halo this, Sonic that. Usually I'm playing Raid Shadow Legends. Just believe me. It's such a fun game to play and it's free to download now on ios and android devices so water you waiting for please go download raid shadow legends and thanks for sponsoring the podcast now back to the show all right donut debate our final comment comes in from my brother josiah who writes in Cronky, you may remember him he got sick this week guys he had a cold might be omnicron i don't fucking know but he did not show up to the stream and therefore we're all going to shun him for that josiah writes in and says we do a lot of talking about burgers and brazilian steakhouse and tacos but there's an area we haven't discussed jesse what are your feelings on donuts personally i love Krispy Kreme. Call me trash, but they are magical. As a kid, I just like glazed or chocolate crap. But as an adult, I've become more sophisticated, and I like jelly filled the, uh, the best. Uh, your comment goes on, but I forgot to screenshot the other half of it, so I'm sorry. I I, I will say I I'm somewhat shocked that a podcast full of elite gamers and and we've made it 133 episodes in without someone mentioning donuts. So brother, thank you for bringing this up, and and we will discuss starting. Now, now you know this, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story for the audience. Uh, we both grew up going to one of those like mega churches every Sunday where, you, you know, those weird churches where it's not like just a church with like a pew and a choir and, and the guy comes out and talks about God for an hour and then you leave. It's like one of those churches that's like the size of a fucking college campus and they got like rock bands that try to appeal to the teenagers and they got like pool tables and beanbag chairs. And it's like one of those like quote unquote cool rock skater churches. And, you know, we growing up in like the in in like the early 2000s, it, it still had a lot of that 90s kind of flair going on. So 
it was a lot of like OG like dude in the in the middle school room at my church growing up we literally had OG Xboxes with Project Gotham Racing and shit like that hooked up like we were playing like DDR and Project Gotham Racing and foosball and pool and listening to like rock bands sing about God and shit during like Sunday at, at church like we went to like the cool church and the reason I bring this up is because they had this room this sacred coveted room at my church called the donut room and it was this room for it was only a available for people who worked for the church or or volunteered to donate time to the church and the thing is growing up you know going to church every week my dad was a volunteer he would he would be like one of the sunday school leaders or whatever for like the like the elementary classrooms and so we would get to church like 20 minutes early every day and then my brother and i would would sl you know slip on into the donut room with my dad and they every every week Again, it's one of those like mega churches. They would order like 50, I'm not even kidding, like 50 to 100 boxes of Krispy Kreme donuts, just massive coolers full of like Coca-Cola, Dasani water bottles, bagels, cream cheese, just everything you can think of. And they just had it laying out. And so, you know, as a six-year-old, eight-year-old, 10-year-old growing up, going to church, you got to understand just like my fucking eyes were just like, what the hell? Like God is cool because I get to go play Halo 2 and eat donuts every Sunday morning. So that was kind of my... That was the only time we ever ate donuts because my, my parents were not going to buy donuts otherwise. And and I remember growing up being like, yo, Krispy Kreme is the sh like, this is awesome. God is cool because he gives you donuts. And that was kind of my my foray into the Krispy Kreme, which for those uninitiated, that is the premier American donut brand uh, as long, as far as, you know, ma major um, donut chains are, are, are concerned. Now, the, the reason I bring this up is because there's, there's a second side to this because – Dunkin' Donut, which, you know, many, many people will be familiar with, one of the more common donut chain brands, wasn't prominent in the Southeast in Georgia and Atlanta where, where we grew up until, until probably around the time I got into high school. And so growing up, all we had were Krispy Kreme. And I remember always eating them being like, these are good, but I think Dunkin' Donuts is cooler, like emo hair flip, because I'm like, that's what they have in New York City where Spider-Man lives and shit like that. So I always thought Dunkin' Donut must be so much cooler than Krispy Kreme. End of discussion. And it wasn't till, and I held this belief arbitrarily without even have, ever eating Dunkin' Donut for the majority of my youth. And it wasn't until pretty much in recent history where I decided, no, Dunkin' Donut actually sucks compared to Krispy Kreme. Because towards my high school and college years, Dunkin' Donuts started aggressively expanding into the Southeast United States to the point where by the time I left Georgia to move to Florida, man, we had like a fucking Dunkin' Donuts was like Starbucks. It was on every corner by that point. And I remember being in denial during those last years I lived in Georgia being like, oh yeah, Dunkin' Donuts is better than Krispy Kreme. Just kind of repressing my youth of going to church and playing Xbox and eating Krispy Kreme for free all fucking Sunday morning. And then... My girlfriend, she she just keeps hounding me. No, no, no. Krispy Kreme is better. So I will say over the past few years living here in Florida where we actually have a Krispy Kreme standalone store, which are not too common, just 10 minutes away from us. I will say I have come to finally accept and finally repent. I feel like a closeted Krispy Kreme fan. I was wrong all these years. You know, I, I was raised with Krispy Kreme and I rejected it because it was common. It was normie. And I thought Dunkin' Donut was the cool brand. But I will say after so many years of having access to both of these brands, Krispy Kreme is far superior. The service is better at the stores. The speed of service is better at the stores, but above that, the donuts are better. The coffee is better. The quality of the food is better. Krispy Kreme is a superior product. It is a superior donut, and I just gotta say, shout out to the like the uh, the the trademarked cream, like K R E M E cream donuts. Those things are fucking awesome. Uh, where are my Krispy Kreme fans at? Please stand up and comment in this week. We need to hear from you. And if you are a Dunkin' Donuts fan, feel free to just uh, hit that dislike button because they've disabled it. No one gives a shit. No one's going to know you didn't like the podcast. So fuck you. Go ahead. Buy an iPhone. Leave me five-star review on, on iTunes, and we'll see you next week. Bye, guys. No, wait. We got to do more. So that's going to do it for our comments this week. Guys, remember for next week, don't be shy. Reply. But next, we'll jump into what I've been playing this week. Before I can tell you about what I've been playing, i got to tell you something real quick because we're talking about food a little bit. i got one more food thing to tell you because we can't talk about what I've been playing until we talk about what I've been eating. And guys, we'll keep it, like I said, quick. But this week, 
I don't mean to brag or nothing, but I'm kind of a Sam's Club card carrying member. So they have this um this line of products in the freezer section of Sam's Club that is like knockoff Chick-fil-A. They have like they're just like chicken nuggets, and then they have the ones that are chicken sandwiches, and then they have waffle fries. And so I've been staring at these for months, resisting every time saying no, I'm good, no, I'm good. And then a couple months ago, we got the nuggets. I caved, I bought the nuggets, and we put them in the air fryer, and they taste almost exactly like Chick fil A nuggets. I'm like, okay, that's fucking crazy. Maybe one day, maybe one day I'll try the sandwiches, fully expecting the sandwiches to be worse because you know it's a frozen chicken sandwich with the bread and all. How are they gonna do this? Well, this week I made the mistake of going to Sam's Club uh, after a day of fasting. So I, I did the bad thing and actually bought shit because I was hungry. And Sam, uh, Sam's Club, forgive me. Um, but, but I caved in. I finally bought these these knockoff Chick-fil-A sandwiches that are Sam's Club branded. Sam's Club exclusive. Very VIP item, guys. But I, I got to be honest. These knockoff Chick-fil-A frozen sandwiches from Sam's Club are painfully accurate. They are so good. The bun is good, not great, but the chicken patty is like, I swear to God, it's just a Chick-fil-A patty. It is so, so good. And again, it's, it's like 15, 16 bucks for the thing. And it comes with 10 sandwiches. So you do the math. It's like in the Chick-fil-A sandwich for just over a dollar. Like, whoa, 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 Captain Value, you know, whoa, what's what's going on? Hi-ho, uh, Mary, Mary go. Um, and you know, for like a dollar fifty a sandwich, I, I, I can't, I can't complain. It is so, so good. You can air fry the chicken. You can just microwave the bitch, whatever you got to do. But guys, Sam's club. I know there's a lot of you guys out there, your Costco members, your BJ's members, whatever it is, guys, there's always time to repent for your sins. If there's anything I learned at donut rock school, Xbox, Jesus church, mega church, it is that. God is endlessly forgiving, even if you murder and rape, just as long as you're willing to accept him as your Lord and Savior. So it is not too late for you to repent for your sins. Guys, just go to Sam's Club, get a membership card, try their knockoff Chick-fil-A sandwiches. You will thank me. They have an exclusive Mountain Dew flavor there in their food court. A Sam's Club pizza is better than Costco pizza. Guys, need I say more? Just fucking do it. I'm not even being paid. I was paid by Raid Shadow Legends, not Sam's Club. And I'm still here talking about why you need a Sam's Club membership. Just do it. And now on to what I've been playing. So, like I said, Spider-Man fucked me up this week. I've just been re-watching Spider-Man movies, thinking about Spider-Man No Way Home. So, I mean, that's that that's that's like the thing for me this week but i have been dabbling in halo infinite multiplayer just to get my daily challenges in um and aside from that i jumped into one evening for like 45 minutes gi joe this is a weird one for me gi joe operation blackout which is a game that came out i think in 2020 so like it's a year old super super budgety shovelware mid-tier kind of game which i love i miss having more of this stuff published by game mill who did that new uh, nickelodeon smash brothers knockoff game and uh developed by fair play labs and iguana b which are two developers i'm sure none of us have ever heard of but this game is third person action based uh active reload like gears of war kind of just gi joe fun and you know what it's it's, it's quite a fun game the, the writing and in, in, in story and everything is dumb just as you expect but it's like saturday morning gi joe cartoon and it's fun it's got this little comic kind of cinematic or like comic cutscene kind of thing going on but the gameplay is fun it's 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 a little shallow it's not super in-depth the controls are like serviceable but not great and it's a lot of fun it was originally like a 40 50 game but i think for ten dollars which is what i paid for it on sale this is more than worth the cost of admission. I've, I don't know why. I, I was never a G.I. Joe fan growing up at any point, but I really liked the Snake Eyes movie that came out this year for some arbitrary reason. And so I guess now I'm buying a G.I. Joe video game because when you're an adult, you uh, find a way to, to remain poor by spending money on things you don't need. And I, I don't know. I, think this, I don't have much to say about this game uh, because it's just so paint by numbers, but it's fun. It's a fun weekend game. Shut off your brain. Just kind of play through it, see it from start to finish, get your achievements and bounce, you know, never, never see it again. And I'm totally fine with that. I think there, there's room for more games like this. I miss kind of middleware shit like this. And I, I wish we had more of it. So they actually, the same publisher, I don't know who, who's developing it, but the same publisher just put out a similar kind of quality uh, nerf first person shooter game. And uh, I'm going to wait for that one to go on sale for 10 bucks too. And I'm also going to, I'm also going to jump into that. So 
I don't know. That's that's what I've been playing because I'm I'm I guess I'm mentally ill. I, I really wanted to jump into the gunk this week, which just came out in Game Pass. I'm hearing really good things about it. Apparently only like a four and a half hour game. Uh, but I really want to jump into that. It looks very good. I know some of you have already played it. So if you have, feel free to write in about it. I'd love to hear more about your experience. But guys, that's it for what I've been playing, what I've been eating, or comments, everything at the start of the show. Oh, I also played the, uh, how did I forget this? I, I also did play the Matrix Awakens, that Unreal 5 engine experience thing that, that they announced at the Game Awards. That's just free to download on Xbox and PlayStation. Guys, this is, this Unreal 5 demo is, it's not a fun game, but it is incredibly impressive this tech demo it's one of those things where it's like obviously they put like 100 percent effort into making this look and feel just super next gen and super technically impressive it makes you wonder you know how many games using unreal engine 5 are actually going to look this good or even close to this good but it is terrible like the the character models in this demo have a very uncanny valley kind of look to them where it's like pretty great but not 100 percent but it is the environments. I swear to God, these environments look 100% ripped out of a movie. They have like the same kind of film grain and camera lens flare and everything, but it it, it, ju it just looks like you're playing a Matrix movie environmentally. The, the, the cars, the buildings, everything looks so incredibly photorealistic and it's I, it's hard to it's hard to say anything about that because it's like right this is what we say every five or ten years about games wow it looks so real i can't believe it's a video game five years later wow that game looks like shit but in the year 2021 this unreal engine 5 experience looks beyond realistic and if you have an xbox series x or playstation 5 i think you would be an absolute dumb idiot with a tiny brain and an even tinier penis if you did not download and try this uh, Unreal Engine 5 demo experience. But with that properly out of the way, guys, let's jump into our, our short news segment this week. All right, babes, let's, let's, let's do this news. We only have two normal stories, then... Then it's all just uh, smaller stuff. I'm telling you guys, it's a slow news week. Remember last time we saw a, a week this slow on the news? I'm pretty sure... I'm um, pretty sure the latest Halo game was Halo o ODST. But our first story comes from the VGC, the Video Games Chronicle, one of my favorite sites these days, who report, or relay, the Psychonauts 2, the developer Double Fine, is working on new multiple, multiple, sorry, multiple new projects, according to a recent blog post. In an update on the crowdfunded platform Fig, the team revealed that it is moving on from Psychonauts 2 onto new projects. Yes, projects with an S, plural. Quote, the studio is already splitting up into various teams and starting different projects that we think you'll really enjoy. We like experimentation here at Double Fine. Every game is a chance to explore new ideas, new visual styles or gameplay, emotions, and more. And quote, earlier in the year, Double Fine boss Tim Schafer said that the team wants to work on something original and completely surprising. Schaefer also said that Double Fine plans to work on multiple projects simultaneously, saying, quote, there was a period at the end of Psychonauts 2 where we all had, where we were hands where we were all hands on deck to finish the game, but we're definitely going back to multiple projects afterwards. Until until it happens again, who knows? We don't have any rules about that, but we're set up to have multiple projects and we have enough ideas to do that. And quote, after Microsoft acquired Double Fine back in 2019, the studio's next titles will be their first to be released exclusively for the platform that supports Xbox Game Pass. Quote, We've been given so much creative freedom now, Tim Schafer said. Nobody has pro probed Psychonauts uh, to second guess our decisions or anything like that. We've been trusted to handle the creative creative side completely, but we can opt into all these creative re all these resources, like having it tested for accessibility and mental health checks. So this is so. There's not much to glean from this news other than kind of what is clearly stated and what was kind of already inevitable. Now, if you'll remember, because here's the thing, let's kind of back up to earlier Double Fine game days, or let's talk about Psychonauts 1 days. That was back when Double Fine kind of made one game at a time. It was like Psychonauts, and we had Brutal Legends and things like that, and they would kind of do the AAA approach of one big game at a time, and then they started splitting off into like the late aughts, 2010s with more of a they had almost more of like like this indie game kind of nimble 
multiple smaller projects thing. They did a lot of like Xbox Live arcade type games. We got Costume Quest and all those kinds of games. And so we've seen a lot of that from Double Fine. In fact, Psychonauts 2 is really the last or or the first kind of big AAA proper game that they've really done in, in quite a while. Yeah, they did Broken Age. They did The Cave. Uh, and they've worked with so many different publishers, too, on all these games, Costume Quest, everything like that. So, you know, you talk about the beginning with Psychonauts, and then really, I, I guess they've always kind of had something of like an indie game kind of smaller game mantra. But really, it was Psych Psychonauts. They did some smaller projects, Brutal Legends. But ever since then, they've really been going with the the smaller kind of project idea. So what I, I bring that up to say... What I'm really interested to find out next from these guys is are they going to are they going to do another big game because now they have the proper funding from Xbox and the creative freedom and the time and in the flexibility with Game Pass to kind of do whatever they want. And the thing is this is when we'll kind of learn is is, is Double Fine a team that likes to do multiple smaller scale, smaller game kind of projects so they can work on a lot of different things and flex their creative muscles? Or is that something they've been doing all this time because it allows them to kind of take smaller risks and, and, and maintain stability as a smaller, more independent team? And I guess that's what we're going to find out next is because they, they could hypothetically do whatever the hell they want at this point, you know? It would be really cool to see. I, I would personally like to see Double Fine, you know, they can do a small project here or there, but it would be cool to see them have a main core team that does a big AAA game because... I'll be honest, when it comes to Double Fine, I played the Psychonauts games, I've played Brutal Legends, I played The Cave, but I never finished it, and I played Costume Quest 1, but I never finished it. And I know people really love Day of the Tentacle and Grim Fandango, which they remastered. And I know people also love some of the other games like Broken Age in particular, so I know they have a lot of games they're known for, but I can only speak to a small a small pool of their games that I'm familiar with. And I'm, I'm just saying, like, I remember when they put out Massive Chalice, like in the middle of the Xbox One generation. That was a game I eventually got through like Games of Gold or something, but never, ever, ever played. And it's just like, are we going to get a lot of stuff like that? Or are we going to get like their next AAA game, you know, their next Psychonauts? So this is kind of the thing here is I want to explore this because we know Xbox's approach with their teams is very hands-off. You guys do what you want. Here's a blank budget. Here's time. We trust you go go make what you want to make and now we get to see what that creativity and that freedom because really now knowing that's how xbox game studios are, are basically treated we know that whatever these developers make is really the intent of the creatives and, and pretty much nothing more because game pass allows flexibility microsoft has deep pockets and is allowing endless flexibility and a very hands-off approach with their studios at least currently and so, I, I don't know, this is an exciting time because although Double Fine has been with Xbox for a few years now, Psychonauts 2 was a game that was announced before the acquisition. It was promised for other platforms beyond, be, be, um, before the acquisition. And, and a lot of the way that game came to be has nothing to do with Xbox's involvement with Double Fine. So this is going to be the start of us trying to get or beginning to get a feel for what does Double Fine look like as a subsidiary of a really well-funded deep pockets, big AAA publisher like Xbox who allows total creative freedom to their teams and has a really flexible platform like Game Pass that allows you to do something really creative and indie and obscure to see how it works because you have a large player base that can try it with low barrier entry, but also, you know, you're well-funded and backed by someone like Xbox, so you can also take a big risk and do a really ambitious AAA project and see how that goes. And again, you know, Game Pass is going to kind of pad the game because people don't have to pay extra to, to give it a try. So I'm really interested to see where Double Fine goes from here. They're one of the studios I was the most interested to learn about where they would go. Because, like, for example, like, you look at a team like Playground Games. Yes, is it surprising they're making Fabled before we knew about the rumors of them doing Fable and everything? Like, yeah, that was a surprise, no doubt. But I never thought for a second, oh, man, now that Xbox acquired Playground Games, I bet they're really going to 
just blow us away with some like limbo or inside style indie darling game. Like, no, no, no. I knew they were going to continue to make really high production, high quality AAA games, mostly racing. Now we know they're working on Fable. So like, that's like, you know, I'm not too surprised. Microsoft bought Bethesda. That's huge news, but I have no doubt in my mind it's going to continue to work on really awesome first person shooters. You know, I, Bethesda Game Studios is going to continue to work on Fallout and Elder Scrolls. I have no doubt about these things. So there are some studios in the Xbox wheelhouse from recent, um, recent acquisitions who it's a little more predictable what that developer is going to do next as part of Xbox uh, as part of team Xbox, but double fine kind of falls under the category of like, Oh, this is really interesting because they are traditionally a smaller, lesser funded team. I'm really curious to see where this kind of security and safety and flexibility of being with Xbox, where this takes them going forward, if that makes sense. So I think this will be definitely one to keep an eye out on. I really do believe we're going to continue to get a lot of smaller scale, maybe more creative and niche kind of obscure, if you want to say, indie type games from them. I think we will definitely continue to get more of that Broken Age, Massive Chalice, the cave type double find that we've been getting over the past decade or so but i really do hope because even though those games are you know hit or miss for people it's like some appeal to some people everyone's got a little something different when they put out something like psychonauts 2 that's something like a lot of people stop and pay attention to and i i really want to see them psychonauts is just such a creative game and psychonauts 2 in particular is so incredibly polished and fun and accessible and in triple a and high quality but very very clever and creative and really unique and unlike anything else on the market i would love to see them continue to apply that kind of ability onto another new big budget high quality i don't want to say high quality because smaller games can be of high quality of course but i want to see them apply that that level of dedication to another big 3d triple a proper console exclusive you know i want i want to see more of that from these guys so We'll have to keep an eye on them, obviously. Um, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if we see another announcement from Double Fine, maybe even this year at E3, 2022 at E3. I really wouldn't be surprised. Um, now, if they do, I think it will be something smaller. It will probably be like the, the B or C game to whatever their A game is. That's probably an early development right now. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if we're, you know, maybe like a year or two off from a smaller project from these guys, to be honest with you. All right. In our second and only other story or big story of the week, this kind of broke right after last week's podcast. So it may seem a little old by this point. If you listen to other Xbox shows, you may have already heard this, but guys, you haven't heard it from me. So basically it hasn't even happened. Well, relaying from Windows Central, conglomerate Tencent acquired Slamfire, the parent company of developer Turtle Rock Studios, announced this past Friday. Turtle Rock Studios is known for its work on the Left 4 Dead games, Evolve, and more recently, the co-op shooter Back for Blood. Turtle Rock notes that despite the acquisition, the studio will continue to run will continue to be run by its co-founders, Phil Robb and Chris Ashton. Turtle Rock Studios plans to use the resources from the acquisition to expand the team and to develop new and exciting multiplayer experiences. The team is also promising to provide future updates on any plans decided for back for blood the quote reads additionally we get to do something really we've never really done before as a studio turn a universe we create into a true long-standing triple a franchise we can ensure that back for blood franchise is here to stay and we'll be working on it well into the future end quote tencent has rapidly grown in the gaming industry over the last few, few years owning right games and acquiring studios like liu uh while also investing in minority stakes in numerous teams like epic bluebird don't nod platinum and uh, weren't they, was it NetEase? Uh, maybe it was NetEase, but they also like threw money into Bungie. Yeah. Anyway, that, um, I, I will say, normally I could rant and rant and rant about this one, but I've done so much uh, opining, or I've done so, no opining, I've done so much soapbox kind of just waxing and waxing on uh, Tencent and their ties to CCP and the weird money involved in all that from a lot of these Chinese conglomerates that are just getting more and more involved in Western game studios and how this is dangerous. And this is something we should be aware of and something we should be weary of and something we should be concerned about and blah, 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 and this and that. I won't talk about that because it, it coming from me at this point, it is such a tired, boring story. It's not, you know, it is important to note is I, I think one of the most important things going on in the games industry at this moment, no doubt, but I don't think I have anything more to add to this experience other than to just say every time they acquire one of these teams, I get a little more sad because even though Back for Blood was a little bit of a letdown for me, I'm sure they're going to turn around and make this game better 
over time, but this makes me want to not play Back for Blood. This makes me not want to support Turtle Rock going forward um, because I don't want to support Tencent. I'm not happy that it, we're, we're really finding ourselves in a situation now where you really can't make a statement, you know, and this is, this kind of bleeds into the Activision thing with like, you know, it's like, Oh, should I buy the new call of duty? I don't know. It's kind of hard to justify paying $70 for call of duty Vanguard when Halo's the better shooter of the year and buying Vanguard is almost like affirming, you know, a, a fucking CEO who threatened to murder someone uh, who works for him. Or, you know, the guy who tried to, uh, sweep under the rug this executive that that executives that worked at sledgehammer and in treyarch who were sexually harassing uh women at these studios and so it's one of these things where it's like there is a there is a moral obligation on the consumer it feels like right like should should i stop buying games that uh, have ten cent dollars behind them. Should I stop supporting Activision? And it's getting to the point so fast as we're seeing the, the the industry consolidate at such a rapid and disgusting and alarming rate that you kind of run into the situation of like, well, what are your real options? Because you can try to take the moral high ground and be like, listen, I'm not going to play anything from Activision anymore because of their abhorrent work culture or I'm not going to play anything from Turtle Rock or from uh, uh, Riot Games because I don't like, you know, communist Chinese dollars injected into my Western video games or uh, right. It's not Western. They're Korean, but you know, injected into my, or is, is Riot Korean? Isn't Riot Korean? I, I could be wrong. Maybe they're from California. I don't know why I'm confused on this, but they could either be from California or South. Oh yeah. They're from California. I don't know why I thought they were South Korean. Whatever. We, we can talk about these things, but it, it gets to a point where everything is so crossed with one another and everything is so hairy that w really what it comes down to is you can either play video games or you cannot play video games because at some point it, it becomes too cross-pollinated that you cannot as a consumer. You have so little authority. You have so little control. You have so little ability to do anything about this situation that really your options come down to like you either play video games or you do not play video games because of the the moralistic op implication of, of what so many of these really, really terrible uh, individuals and, and some of the these uh, publishers and investment conglomerates represent behind the scenes. And so this is the thing. I, I almost hate this argument because it almost just sounds like trying to talk yourself out of playing any role over any bit of responsibility. And, th and this is the downside of a globalized world is just that every action you have has a has a reaction you know it's like i i can't i can innocently be like i want to buy this stupid thing on the internet because i need whatever it is you know a green screen for my twitch stream uh, a fucking nerf gun because i'm a, a giant man child a a small little collectible trinket to buy my parent for christmas as a little christmas gift whatever it is these seemingly innocent purchases have a ripple effect you know you buy that whatever $16 item on on Amazon because you want to get your mom this thing for Christmas and there's this ripple effect of like okay you just supported Amazon Amazon notoriously uh, prices out smaller companies so it can literally bankrupt competition to the point where it basically monopolizes the market and it does so because it has so much capital that they can set their prices so fucking low to the point where smaller businesses can't compete and they are forced to be driven out of business because Amazon has a product and a service that is so good it cannot be competed with with prime shipping with prime the subscription service with the cheapest prices on any good you want to buy with the convenience of one click on your fucking iPhone and the things there at your doorstep what can you do but you buy something on Amazon and boom you just, you just affected small businesses without even knowing so. Also, you just perpetuated a major corporation that treats its employees like shit, that doesn't pay them well, doesn't give them proper benefits, and doesn't take care of its own at all. Meanwhile, the CEO of the company is the wealthiest man in the goddamn world, and he knowingly lets his bottom-of-the-barrel staff suffer and work their fucking asses off and basically enslave themselves for this company that gives almost nothing back in return. Okay, you bought your mom something on Amazon, you just contributed to that. But I said ripple effects. So also, that thing you bought, aside from Amazon, is actually manufactured and produced by some company in China that is made for dirt cheap. The reason why you were able to get that thing for so little is because it was made by essentially Chinese slave labor because the government in China doesn't have laws protecting its own people and they're willing to take advantage of and just use and abuse and 
just work the fuck out of their own people to the point where there's probably some kid who, because child labor laws aren't a thing, was paid basically slave wage to create this thing for you. So some company could sell it to you at low cost, which put some smaller business out of, out of, you know, out of commission, <laughs> which was only furthered by Amazon's ability to sell it to you fast and conveniently for cheaper than the competition. And it becomes this ripple effect of like, listen, man, you were just trying to buy this little trinket or doll or whatever thing for your mom for Christmas. Cause you're trying to be a good kid, but look at what you did as a consumer. Look at what you just did. And it becomes that kind of conversation with gaming where it's like, listen, man, I know Bobby Kotick is a fucking ass white. I know. I know there are examples of a few really bad apples at Activision Studios like Treyarch and in, in, uh, in, in Sledgehammer and as well as Blizzard Studio, as well as Blizzard as you know, with like some of the leaders and in, in key personnel at that at that developer. But the thing is, you not buying Diablo 2, you not buying Call of Duty Vanguard fucks the people that don't suck more than anyone. You know, the developers who are like, hey, I know you guys are tired of Call of Duty. I, I know everyone riffs on it because it comes out every year and you guys think it's so uninspired. But like, listen, this is like the first big game I ever worked on. I, I'm this random developer you've never heard of at Sledgehammer Games who is promoted to a big directorial role or a big, you know, like producer role in this on this project. And this was a huge opportunity for me to help lead a team and help work on a project and leave my stamp on this game and this franchise I love to death and to try and reinvent and, and freshen up this game in a way that, you know, it had a lot of my personality and a lot of my passion and a lot of my creative efforts poured into this. And you standing back and just saying, fuck Activision for this guy that fucked over this girl and the CEO that covered for him. You saying fuck Activision as a whole and not buying the game is hurting me, the creative who just wanted to make a really awesome game for you to experience. And, you know, you saying me saying like, don't play games from Turtle Rock Studios because Tencent invested in them is just hurting all the people, all the innocent people at Turtle Rock Studios who are like, listen, we had no say in this acquisition. It was people way higher than us who, you know, who made these calls and signed these papers and shook hands and made these deals behind closed doors. We just really want to make an awesome zombie shooter for you guys to enjoy and have a fun time with. And again, long-winded way of just saying no one has clean hands it is impossible from the standpoint of a consumer this is why things like boycotting and shit just don't actually work and don't actually do anything in the modern world is everything is so is so globalized and in and depend on such a massive market just because you and in, in your in your moralistic and self-righteous frame group that can maybe represent a percentage of a percentage of the population you know who consumes a particular product or service maybe you guys take a stand against a bad corporation you know a, a bad business practice uh, a, an employee scandal something like that and in, in hopes that it will raise awareness will make something good happen but ultimately you are completely powerless and nothing you do will change that and so yeah you can say i swear off turtle rock i swear off activision i swear off amazon because even if my personal decision doesn't make a difference in the grand scheme of things, I know that I'm trying my best to live a morally righteous life and to not contribute in my own small, meaningless way to, to the, to the, the chaos and in the, in the destruction and everything. And unfortunately, I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. This is one of those things. It's like the, the only way for real change to, to occur really isn't for you or I to decide what games we do and don't play. Unfortunately, this becomes a bigger political conversation that I'm not about to have here on my Xbox podcast, but this is a thing where People much bigger than us as the everyday man who just wants to play a video game and have fun need to step in here and do something about this. And, and, and it's great that people try to raise awareness. I'm not saying people should give up and not write articles and not and not use their voices on, on social media or whatever and try to bring awareness to these things. That absolutely is a great thing that people try to bring awareness to, to real problems. But I'm saying... You making the decision to play or not to play Back for Blood, to to buy Call of Duty Vanguard or not to buy Call of Duty Vanguard or, or Diablo 2 Remaster, whatever, that ultimately probably does more harm than good. And this is something I've been going back and forth on for a while. I've been I've been trying to get more people's takes on this story, um, not this story particularly, but this ongoing issue we've come into, especially this past year in the games industry, to just kind of see where people fall on this. And I, I really don't mean what I'm saying from this perspective of like, guys, I've given up and I don't want to do the hard thing of giving up Call of Duty because it's the right thing to do. I'm going to keep playing it and look for a way to and way to morally um, justify my desire to play Call of Duty Zombies. Like, that's not what I'm trying to do here. 
but it, it, it is important to know this is these are serious problems and I don't think us as a niche group of people who like Xbox deciding like, oh man, we need to boycott this team or, or not play that game. I don't, I really think it's just ultimately what you're really doing is you're just disrespecting developers who really worked hard on these games that you otherwise would enjoy if it weren't for the fact that people way above their pay grade are slimy sacks of shit who continue to make the world a worse place by exploiting slave labor and, and, and aligning with governments that uh, are absolutely just abhorrent and, and need to be overthrown. And, 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 you know, it's just, it's just one of those things we have absolutely no control over the situation. So yeah, Turtle Rock Studios, the guys that created Left 4 Dead, one of my all time favorite games, a game that makes me painfully nostalgic, um, recently released Back for Blood. They are now, you know, owned by Slamfire, who is now owned by Tencent, which is a company that has a over 20% rate of employees who are <laughs> identified as members of the Chinese Communist Party, a a <laughs> a political uh, a, a sorry a government that literally sterilizes and imprisons and enslaves Uyghur Muslims, denies Taiwanese statehood and in, 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 in agency and identity. And uh, un unfortunately, because of the way globalization has been manipulated and the way these markets work, <laughs> you know, I'm not trying to make a political statement. I'm just saying simply because of the way these things work and, and the lack of power and ability we have as just individuals, this is one of those things where it's like, yeah, you want to go play that new really awesome zombie shooter because you work a nine to five and you'd like to come home from your job and just have a good time with your buddies after work. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> you are contributing to uh, a genocide. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's just one of those things. In the most indirect way, that's unfortunately the world we live in. But hey, it, it's always been that way, man. Like, <laughs> your smartphone is, is, is made off slave labor. But yeah, we'll just keep complaining about, I don't know, whatever the fuck we're complaining about. Chip shortages or something. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's really it for the news. I don't mean to be so dour. I know it's... <laughs> By the time this podcast goes live, we are a day away from Christmas Eve, two days away from Christmas Day, a major holiday. I don't, I don't mean to be so dour, but that's, uh, that's what's in the news. And, um, you know, it's like, what else do you want me to say? I mean, as, as they put it here for now, at least, uh, Turtle Rock Studios is allowed to continue to operate independently and as they were, as if Tencent wasn't even there, but this is the reality of who's behind behind the curtain, behind the scenes. And uh, at least at the end of the day, I can tell you this much, guys. Halo Infinite is a very good game, and Spider-Man No Way Home is a very good movie. So if, if, if anything, take solace in knowing that, um, th that those forms of entertainment are definitely worth your time. Now, that's going to do it for all of our news news. Let's try to brighten things up as we wrap up the podcast with the important enough news. These are stories important enough to, just, to make the podcast, but not important enough to warrant their own discussions, of which we have a small handful which I think is the exact same word tracking I use every week. But gamesindustry.biz reports that Sweden firm Embracer Group, another conglomerate that's basically just buying up the industry and consolidating all into one, but uh, as far as we know, politically a lot less uh, <laughs> a lot less malicious, uh, has entered an agreement to acquire three more companies in the gaming space, including entertainment publisher Dark Horse Media. Yeah, like Dark Horse Comics, like the, the comic book people. The deal marks a leap into cross media for Embracer as it's gain as it gains access to Dark Horse's roster of over 300 intellectual properties, as well as its comic publishing and TV production arms. Dark Horse founder CEO Mike Richardson will continue to run the company. The terms of the deal were not disclosed. Embracer subsidiary Saber. Embracer subsidiary Saber Interactive has also acquired 100% of the shares of Shiver Entertainment, a Florida-based development studio led by industry vet. Veterans John Shapert and Jason Anderson. Shiver Entertainment was founded in 2013 and has grown to almost 20 people. It focuses primarily on co-development of porting projects across multiple platforms. Moving forward, the studio will operate as a subsidiary under Saber, which operates under Embracer. Uh, Shapert, who currently serves as Shiver Entertainment CEO, will take on significant responsibilities in Saber's work for hire business. Lastly, Embracer has entered an agreement to acquire 100% shares in German video on demand channel Spot Film Networks uh, via another subsidiary, Coke Media. The company will also operate under Coke going forward and will continue to operate operations from the current office in Berlin. Terms of Shiver Entertainment and Spot Film Network deals were also not disclosed. We'll say Coke Media actually 
also pretty fucking slimy as they uh, are a huge, huge, really prominent lobbyists uh, in here in Washington, the U.S., they have a lot of money being thrown away, being thrown around into politics. So that is another slimy, slimy group of very wealthy people who are buying up all the uh, entertainment in the entertainment industry. But this would normally be a pretty big news story, but I just have so little insight, so little information in, in, in knowledge of, of any kind kind of offer here that we're going to leave it in this in this kind of. Uh, echelon of news just because I really wouldn't be able to do the story justice but this is some massive talent and we're starting to see this more and more where these conglomerates are starting to get outside of just video games as far as entertainment industry but also by comic book companies and board game companies and all these other kinds of things so pretty soon here it's going to be Embracer Group, Tencent, Xbox, Sony, the Walt Disney Company and I don't know N NBC or some shit like that. What, who, what is it? I don't fucking know. It's it's gonna be pretty slim here, man. There's gonna be like five overlords in the entertainment industry. So let's uh let's let's embrace let's let's embrace her ourselves for this. Next up, VGC reports that Ubisoft have revealed its plans to stage an immersive symphonic co concert to celebrate Assassin's Creed's 15th anniversary, even though no one gives a shit. Created in partnership with Overlook Events. The event will include a full orchestra and choir supported by video lighting and sound effects. The world premiere of Assassin's Creed Symphonic Adventure will take place at the Grand Rex in Paris on October 29th, 2022, with a world tour scheduled to begin in early 2023. Notable, there will be no NFTs associated with this symphonic adventure. Next up, VGC reports that the first season of content for Battlefield 2042 will seemingly begin on March 2022. In March 2022, according to a data mine, trusted Battlefield data mire. Trusted Battlefield data miner Temporal, Temporial, Temporial uh, tweeted that the game's client includes weekly missions for 12 preseason weeks. The point this points to a March 2022 release for the game's first season. The tweet also contains text referring to a new map included in season one, which is likely named Exposure. And next up, speaking of Back for Blood, a new update has released for the game, adding a single player campaign mode. Until now, the only option available for solo 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 players, goddamn, uh, was a training mode, which had the game's booster cards unlocked so players could experiment with them. Because you know that's apparently fun. However, the new mode did include any sort of progression. Today's update adds proper solo campaign with actual progression, meaning players can play through the story with the same benefits and upgrades that they'd receive if they were playing online. Thank God. Now I can play the game. Lastly, VGC reports that Far Cry's crossover Danny Tre Trejo mission are now available to play more than a month after they were accidentally released early. The DLC contains two missions, both starring the actor himself rather than a character. So that's going to do it for all of our news this week now normally i would do the new game releases of the week but the xbox wire actually didn't put up a list so i will say the gunk is a newly released game people are seem to really dig in that i am interested in giving it a try absolutely check that out xbox is also having a massive year-end sale that just began 50 percent off a lot of games and shit like that so definitely look through that sale if you're looking for something on the cheap to jump into and then finally of course halo infinite i mean if you if you haven't played it you're going to hell and as a reminder, guys, Games with Gold for the uh, month of December as we round out the month. The Escape is 2, still available. Tropico 5 Penultimate Edition is available until January 15th. Orcs Must Die, you missed it. So fuck you, I don't think I downloaded that either. Oops. And Insanely Twisted Shadow Planet is available until the 31st of the month. So be sure to download those games. But guys, with that, that's going to do it for our podcast this week. We kept it under an hour and a half for the first time in like, I don't, maybe like a year. I don't know. God, that's impressive. But thank you guys so much for your support. I do want to say for those of you who celebrate the holiday, Merry Christmas. Have a wonderful holiday. For those of you who uh, celebrate Hanukkah, I know it's a little belated, but happy Hanukkah. For those of you who celebrate Kwanzaa, of which I've never met a person in my entire life who celebrates Kwanzaa, but they are those people are out there. And so I will say if you happen to be one of them, Happy Kwanzaa to you. Also, Happy New Year, but we will we will commence one more time before the New Year, so we'll see you next week for the final episode of the year of Xbox On. Please be sure to check out my new YouTube video. It's linked in the in, in the description. Uh, it would mean a lot to me. Follow me on Twitter at Jesse DeRosa. Please chat with me. Be my friend. Play with me on Twitch at twitch.tv slash lightning extreme. I want to hang out with you guys. I want to grow this shit. I want to do more and more videos, more podcasts, more streams, more hanging out, more talking. 
it's most fun when you guys are are here being my friend. To be honest, it's uh, it's 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 not a lot of fun when I'm just talking into the void. So that's not me putting the responsibility on your shoulders, but I I, I could. That's more so just me saying, uh, you know, don't be shy. I tr- I I say it jokingly because it's cute and fun. Don't be shy. Reply, but I genuinely mean it. It, it every time you guys reach out, it's, it it means the world. I really do appreciate it. and I love engaging with you guys. So thank you all so much for the support. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. We'll see you next week for a special episode. And don't forget to write in with your top five favorite games you played in 2021. Until then, gamers, how are your dreams? <laughs>